Jugurtha, the king of Numidia, had proven himself to be a clever opponent who knew dangerously well the weaknesses of not only Rome's military might, but also its political apparatus. Leveraging these skills, he would orchestrate a brilliant campaign to not only halt, but utterly destroy the legions sent after him. These plans would climax at the Battle of Suthul, where betrayal and surprise of disastrous proportions would result in his own African Teutoburg. I love getting to cover history, which often gets overlooked by traditional media. This passion is shared by our sponsor, Curiosity Stream, the best place to find and watch documentaries about science, history, technology, nature, travel, and so much more. Curiosity Stream has exclusive award-winning films and shows that you can't watch anywhere else. It's the Hulu for history buffs and the Disney Plus for science lovers, which features the deepest collection of documentaries of any streaming service out there. Here's a taste of some of my favorite content on their platform. Rebuilding Ancient Rome brings antiquity to life by combining stunning 3D recreations and the archaeological expertise of Dr. Darius Arya, from the Circus Maximus to the Harbor of Trajan and the Baths of Caracalla. It's everything we aspire to achieve with our own True Size series. Another gem is the Lost Kingdoms of Africa, which covers the unsung civilizations of the continent. From the regions of Nubia to Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, and more, I learned a ton. Other highlights for me include a documentary series on how Legos are made, and a fascinating David Attenborough special on how animals produce light. I could go on and on, but you get the picture. This is the place for people who want to know more. With new shows added every week and content available worldwide to watch across all your favorite streaming devices, I can highly recommend it. So go to curiositystream.com Invicta or scan the QR code for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And for our fans, use promo code Invicta and you will save 25% off. It's already one of the most affordable and best deals in streaming. So dive on in. Following his bloody victory at Cerda and the execution of his rival Adarbal, King Jugurtha had secured his rule of Numidia. He now sat comfortably atop the throne, confident that his extensive bribery campaign would keep the greedy Roman political system from holding him to account. Indeed, when news of the events at Cerda reached Rome, a heated debate ensued in the Senate, where at first it seemed as if Jugurtha's bribes would once again be able to protect him. His allies in the aristocracy constantly tried to minimize the severity of his actions, often by interrupting Jugurtha's detractors mid-speech or holding long, procrastinating speeches themselves that dragged the Senate's meetings on and on without anything being resolved. However, Jugurtha was now opposed by a fiery tribune of the plebs known as Gaius Memmius, who began to spread word among the Roman people of the corruption within the Senate and Jugurtha's influence over their leaders. His aim? was to force the Senate to act by ramping up public pressure and unrest among the plebeian population. The populist strategy proved effective, as outrage quickly spread, especially with reports of Roman citizens having been left to die at Cerda due to the Senate's fecklessness. Backed into a corner, the Senate finally decided to raise an army against Jugurtha in 111 BC, placing the consul Lucius Bestia Calpurnius in charge of the campaign. This response surprised Jugurtha, who had not expected Rome to rediscover its honor so suddenly. Nevertheless, he was still hopeful that the corruption within the Republic could be exploited to give him an advantage in the coming war, and so he sent his son and two of his friends to Rome to attempt his tried and trusted tactic of mass bribery. This time though, the Numidian delegation was denied entry to the capital entirely unless they were prepared to unconditionally surrender to Rome. This was clearly unacceptable to Jugurtha, and so his delegation left Italy with their mission unfulfilled. Calpurnius now led his army towards Numidia, first marching from Regium to Sicily, from where he transported his troops to Africa. At first the campaign went well for the Romans, who raided the Numidian countryside and succeeded in capturing several settlements. However, although Calpurnius was renowned for his intelligence and skills as a commander, he had one fatal flaw that Jugurtha was quick to exploit. Greed. According to our sources, Jugurtha approached the consul and offered him lavish bribes in exchange for delaying the Roman advance, and even succeeded in winning over no lesser of a figure than Scarus, 
the senator who only a short time previously had led a delegation to Africa to reprimand Jugurtha. This recent purchase greatly increased Jugurtha's confidence, who was now hopeful that the war could be ended on favorable terms to him. So confident was he in the ability of his new allies to deliver such a result that Jugurtha officially surrendered to Calpurnius by presenting himself at their camp and handing over a tribute of silver, horses, and thirty elephants. This offer was quickly accepted and a truce was brokered. Thus, just as quickly as the Roman campaign had begun, it was brought to an abrupt halt. Unlike the days of old when the legions might have remained present to ensure the total and unquestionable submission of their foes, the armies of Calpurnius simply abandoned the theater of war altogether. The general, with victory in hand, now preferred to reap the rewards in Italy by presiding over the upcoming elections. But back in Rome, rumors had spread about the corruption within Calpurnius's army which caused more outrage among the people. To settle the affair, Memmius convinced the Senate to have Jugurtha appear before them alongside Calpurnius and his other accomplices to face charges of bribery where their crimes could be exposed before all of Rome. Although at first reluctant to go to Rome, Jugurtha eventually decided to travel to the capital to face this trial head-on, accompanied by the praetor Lucius Cassius. Upon arriving at the Eternal City in 110 BC, Jugurtha once again began to turn the tables in his favor through bribery. His chief acquisition appears to have been the tribune of the plebs, Gaius Babius. When Jugurtha appeared before the Senate, Babius was able to use his tribune's veto power to prevent any evidence from being brought forward and to even bar Jugurtha from speaking outright, placing the trial in limbo. Thus, Jugurtha bribed his way out of a bribery trial. Unsurprisingly, Jugurtha and his allies only grew bolder after this legal triumph. The king now seized upon the opportunity to attack his political rivals within Rome itself, his first target being his cousin Massiva, who was in exile in the city. Apparently, Jugurtha bribed gangs to stalk his prey and determine his normal daily routines, after which they pounced on Massiva and cut him down. Unfortunately for Jugurtha, however, one of the assassins had been overly aggressive and was himself swiftly captured. The thug provided evidence that incriminated Jugurtha, which was damning enough that even the king's bribed officials could no longer guarantee his safety. Jugurtha thus returned to Numidia, reportedly making the following remark on Rome, that quote, It was a city for sale, and soon to be doomed, if only it found a buyer. The war was now back on in Africa. In 110 BC, a new force led by consul Spurius Postumus Albinus made its arrival. The situation, however, was far from ideal for Rome. Albinus's predecessor's corruption had rubbed off on his troops and the army's discipline was in a pathetic state. Many of the soldiers had been bribed by Jugurtha and were selling off much of the tribute the king had handed over to Calpurnius and even sold off deserters back to the Numidians. Albinus was to prove an ideal commander for such an army. Albinus's first order of business was to whip this army into shape. At first, the consul prepared for the war with impressive speed, shipping large quantities of supplies and money to the army in Africa, and was determined to bring Jugurtha to heel quickly before the next round of elections in Rome. However, once in the field, Albinus proved to be a highly inept commander and was easily manipulated by Jugurtha. On numerous occasions, the Numidian king feigned a willingness to surrender, only to abruptly back away from any agreement made with Albinus instead taking advantage of these periods of negotiation to further delay the war. Throughout these long months, some advances into enemy territory were made by both sides, but they never resulted in any serious fighting. In this way, Jugurtha deliberately ran out the clock on the campaigning season. As the months rolled by, Albinus eventually left Africa ahead of the imminent elections in Rome, leaving his brother Aulus in charge with the rank of Propraetor. The younger Albinus was also hoping to bring the war to a swift conclusion, whether it was by crushing Jugurtha in battle or using a show of force to intimidate the Numidians into submission. Thus early the next year, in January of 109 BC, Albinus led his army into the field, force marching it to the city of Suthul, where Jugurtha had stored his treasury, which undoubtedly the ambitious Roman commander coveted. Yet despite Suthul's imposing natural and man-made defenses, as well as the poor weather, Albinus began to prepare for a siege and also to look for ways to quickly storm the city. It was at this moment that Jugurtha suddenly appeared from behind, 
having led his army close enough to Albinus' camp that the Romans were tempted to abandon the siege altogether in favor of finally facing him in open battle. The plan worked, and Albinus impetuously chased after Jugurtha, who lured the Romans into ever more remote regions, far away from friendly territory and their lines of supply. As the Romans marched on, Jugurtha's agents infiltrated their camp, armed with money, which they used to bribe several centurions and auxiliary officers. Some of these deserted outright, while others remained in the Roman camp with instructions from Jugurtha to abandon their posts only at a given signal. Once these turncoats were sufficiently spread throughout the Roman army, Jugurtha now prepared to attack Albinus's camp at night. The Romans now found themselves surrounded on all sides by Numidians, and panic quickly erupted in the camp, at which point Jugurtha ordered his men forward. Now, the full extent of the treachery within the Roman army was revealed, as a cohort of Ligurian infantry and two squadrons of Thracian cavalry switched sides to the Numidians, while the senior centurion of the 3rd legion opened the gates to Jugurtha's forces. In this way, the Roman army was utterly defeated and did not even mount any serious resistance, instead making a chaotic retreat to a nearby hill while the Numidians spent the night plundering their camp with impunity. The next morning, Jugurtha and Albinus spoke, where the king demanded that the Romans withdraw from Numidia within the next ten days, after going through the symbolic humiliation of passing under a yoke. Albinus was highly reluctant to accept such a blatant capitulation, but knew that his demoralized army, which had abandoned much of its equipment and had no supplies, stood little chance in battle. Thus, the Romans bitterly and humiliatingly agreed to Jugurtha's terms. Unsurprisingly, news of the disastrous defeat at Suthul was not received well back in Rome. The elder Albinus now scrambled to save his family's reputation from the predicament ordering the muster of new forces to bolster the army in Africa, while also doing his best to ensure Jugurtha's shameful peace treaty would not be accepted. Within a few days of receiving the reports of the disaster at Suthul, Albinus returned to Africa, planning to take to the field and avenge his brother. However, the Roman troops in Africa were bogged down with poor discipline and corruption, and the situation was so dire that Albinus simply gave up on the campaign and waited in the Roman province for whoever might replace him. The Senate could not let this setback go unaddressed, and it was clear that new direction was needed for the war in Africa. Once the new elections were complete, command of the war now fell to the consul Quintus Caecilius Metellus. He was a respected and capable individual, but perhaps most important for this war, he was also impressively disdainful of wealth and avarice, unlike his predecessors, meaning that Jugurtha could not simply bribe him. His first task was to restructure the Roman army in Africa by raising fresh levies to bolster its ranks and recruiting additional allied contingents, as well as procuring a large stockpile of additional supplies. Once these preparations were complete, Metellus left Rome for Africa to take command of the war in person and hopefully turn the tide against Jugurtha. Among his staff there was a legate by the name of Gaius Marius, who was soon to make a name for himself in the coming months of the war. The army that Albinus handed to Metellus was in a pathetic state, and the consul realized that discipline would need to be restored before any campaign could be launched. He first cracked down on the soldiers' practice of selling food in the camp, and greatly reduced the number of slaves and camp followers within the army. He then began regularly leading the army out on route marches, at the end of which they would build a fully fortified camp, something which had been neglected under Albinus. Metellus was even known to personally lead the troops on foot at the front of the march column. Thus, in short order, the consul was able to restore discipline and morale among the troops. Jugurtha had also not been idle and was receiving reports on the Romans' preparations. The king sent envoys to open negotiations with Metellus, perhaps filling him out for the chances to bribe him. However, not only did these talks come to a dead end, but Jugurtha now found his own underhanded methods being used against him, as Metellus convinced each of the envoys in turn to betray their master and return to him under guise of continued loyalty. In this way, Metellus hoped to be able to have Jugurtha turned over to him by treacherous followers, or failing that, have him assassinated outright. It was now a war of bribery. With his envoys rebuffed, and the Roman Republic finally seeming to be determined to bring him to heel, 
Jugurtha began to realize that he would once more need to fight to maintain his grip over Numidia. And as Metellus' army prepared to march out, Jugurtha himself was laying out plans for the coming campaign that could perhaps seal his fate. Stay tuned as we continue our series on the Jugurthian War. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our Patreon where we post script previews, give you HD downloads of all our art, and make available polls to vote on what we cover next. A big thanks to our current patrons for funding the channel, and to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. We couldn't have done it without this team and this community. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe for more content, and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.